approved San Pedro um, Riparian National Conservation Area, otherwise gonna be called Sprinka quite often today, and its resource management plan. I wanna take a moment and express a heartfelt appreciation to each of you for joining us here today. Uh, this diverse group of participants in this meeting shows the importance of this area and its value to each of us. Uh, we take your participation seriously and greatly appreciate your interest. At this time, I'd like to mention the Sprinka implementation team. So as I uh, name you, please go ahead and give a wave so everybody can see you in the cameras. Uh, but Amy McGowan, June Lowry, Colleen Bergmanis, and Margie Guzman. Now, Colleen and Margie will introduce themselves and have their staff uh, do some self-introductions. Hello, good morning. My name is Colleen Bergmanis. I'm an assistant field manager at the Tucson field office. I'm responsible for the non-renewable resources. Thank you so much for attending. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. I'm Kim Ryan, cultural resource specialist with the BLM at the Tucson field office. Hi, everybody. I'm Francisco Mendoza, outdoor recreation planner, Tucson field office, BLM. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Margie Guzman, Assistant Field Manager for the Renewable Resources Staff. Uh, we encompass the range, vegetation, wildlife, fisheries, hydrology, and soils programs. Now let my staff introduce themselves. Hello, I'm uh, Eric Baker. I'm a Rangeland Management Specialist. Hello, this is Dave Murray, and I work as the hydrologist for the Tucson Field Office. Hello, my name is Teresa Kondo and I work as the vegetation technician for the Tucson field office. And I'm Emilio Correa, I work as a rangeland technician in Tucson field office. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie? All right. Thank you. Um, and as you may have all uh, taught earlier, I'm Jamie Lopez. I'm the BLM Tucson field office manager. Um, so, We've now moved into the implementation of the resource management plan. That means putting the goals and objectives from the resource management plan into action. Uh, we plan to keep our partners and stakeholders informed throughout the implementation process. We value your input. Moving forward, there may be specific Im implementation actions that we ask for your input on. This may be through the NEPA process during the development of an environmental assessment or proposed resource related actions, which ultimately assist us in meeting the goals and objectives outlined in the resource management plan. It may also include standing up stakeholder working groups. And what those groups look like will really depend on uh, stakeholder interests. It may also include a closer resource issue review and opportunities to provide input to the BLM to consider. And we'll talk more about this at the end of the meeting. The BLM will remain dynamic in achieving our goals and objectives. Understanding that the circumstances and urgency in achieving those objectives may change over time based on emerging issues and needs. For today's meeting, we will provide a high level summary of the Sprinka RMP decisions. Talk about how we have implemented the new hunting decisions and are implementing the livestock grazing decisions and vegetation management. We'll answer some stakeholder questions as time allows and discuss the possibility of establishing working groups based on stakeholder interests. If we run out of time to answer questions uh, that you guys pose to us, we will email answers back to the stakeholders that ask those questions. I will now turn it over to our facilitator, Tani, to introduce the first presenter. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, the first presenter is Amy McGowan, uh, who will give an overview of the RMP process, implementation, and adaptive management. All right, thank you, Tani. Before I start, I just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen and that they're not and that not everyone's looking at presenter mode. So am I good? Okay, awesome. All right, so no, most of you remember me from the development of the Sprinka RMP. And I'm just gonna talk pretty briefly today about implementation of the RMP. And for those of you that weren't part of the RMP process, I am gonna provide a little bit of an RMP refresher. But don't worry, I'm not gonna give my whole RMP presentation. For those of you that sat through all the draft public meetings, I'm sure you don't want me to do that. All right. So at a high level, 
we have the enabling legislation, which is Public Law 10696, which established the Sprinka. And that's really the framework under which we developed the Sprinka Resource Management Plan, the RMP, and also under which we will do implementation. So again, the enabling legislation, Public Law 10696, was the framework under which we developed the Sprinka RMP. And then the Sprinka RMP is the framework under which we will do implementation. The, just a little brief reminder, the Sprinka RMP, the Sprinka RMP made high level decisions. The three of the main things it did was it established, it, it established goals, objectives, and resource allocations. So the Sprinka RMP describes what we want the resources to look like. And then it also makes decisions about where we can and can't do different uses. Then stepping down from that, and that's all at a broad scale, and it doesn't talk about specifically where on the ground we're going to do specific action. So, so we step down from that in implementation, and we actually talk about where on the ground and how we're going to do specific actions. That can take a variety of forms. One way we can do implementation is we can develop implementation plans, like an integrative vegetation management plan that might describe where and how we're actually going to do those vegetation treatments that we described at a high level in the RMP and provided the framework for in the RMP, but we didn't describe where on the ground we were actually going to do them. It can also take the form of a specific action like erosion control that's not actually a plan but can be implemented at the site specific scale. And that might be described in a site-specific NEPA document, like an environmental assessment. Then, our, then we can also do things like implement the grazing decisions through land health evaluation and grazing lease renewals. Our ongoing resource monitoring that we are going to continue to do to make sure that we're meeting our goals and, object, and objectives established in the resource management plan is also part of implementation. I just want to remind everyone that the Sprinka was established in 1988 by the Arizona-Idaho Conservation Act, which was Public Law 10696, which I just mentioned on the previous slide. And the Sprinka was established to conserve, protect, and enhance the riparian area, the aquatic, wildlife, archaeological, paleontological, scientific, cultural, educational, and recreational resources of the San Pedro River. That enabling legislation also described that the secretary shall only allow such uses of the conservation area as he finds will further the primary purposes for which the conservation area was established. And again, this is really important. It's really important to remember the enabling legislation because it, it sets the framework under which we developed the resource management plan and then the, and that further creates the framework under which we do implementation. So like I said at the beginning of this presentation, I was going to give a little bit of a RMP refresher. So just for those of you that weren't part of the RMP process, we worked on the Sprinka RMP from approximately 2013 to 2019. And the RMP was approved in 2019 with the final document which is the Sprinka Record of Decision and Approved Resource Management Plan. And those decisions provide a high-level framework that guides management decisions for the Sprinka, and all of our implementation is guided by the Sprinka RMP. Again, it establishes goals and objectives that describe the resource conditions that we're trying to meet through our implementation actions. It makes resource allocation decisions, so what that means is the RMP describes where we can and can't do an activity, such as livestock grazing. The RMP describes where livestock grazing is allowed and where we can't have livestock grazing. But it doesn't authorize the on-the-ground action. So it doesn't say specifically where we're going to do something like a vegetation treatment project. That is what we do in implementation. And it replaces the San Pedro River Riparian Management Plan that we had been managing the Sprinka under for the past 30 years. 
So for those of you that were part of the Sprinkler RMP process, you probably remember our four alternatives. And this is what we looked at through the NEPA process on the RMP. So there were three main stages to the RMP. There was the draft RMP, the proposed RMP, and then our final document, which is our approved RMP and record of decision that has all the final decisions in it. And in the draft RMP and the proposed RMP, we had these four alternatives which we looked at in those two documents and we analyzed the impacts of those four alternatives. And throughout the draft RMP and the proposed RMP, alternative C was the agency proposed, was the agency preferred alternative. And we made some adjustments to that agency preferred alternative between the draft RMP and the proposed RMP. For example, in the draft RMP, we had a more expanded livestock grazing alternative. And then in the proposed RMP, we scaled the livestock grazing decision back to about just under 7,000 acres. All of those decisions that were made in the approved Sprinka RMP and record of decision are apply to the BLM land within the Sprinka boundary. And you see the Sprinka boundary outlined in dark blue on this slide. And I know all of you are very familiar with the Sprinka and where it is. All right, so I've already talked a lot about this in my presentation, but just to recap, Sprinka RMP implementation is analysis and implementation of on the ground site specific actions that are allowed for and outlined in the RMP. So I've already given several examples such as vegetation treatment projects, erosion control projects, various recreation projects like putting up signs, various recreation infrastructure, things of that nature. They're actions to achieve the resource management plan goals and objectives. They can be step-down implementation level plans, such as a travel management plan. And they can also be projects such as erosion control structures that are analyzed in environmental assessments or other NEPA documents. This slide right here just gives everyone a reminder of the process that we've been through to date. So as I mentioned, we worked on developing the Sprinkler RMP starting in 2013 all the way through 2019. And now here we are in implementation and we're implementing the Sprinkler RMP. And as we move forward into implementation of the Sprinkler RMP, I just want to remind everyone of the stakeholder engagement and involvement that we did during the RMP process. We had field trips, we had forums we had and we had various meetings on different aspects of the RMP. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the concept of adaptive management and how it could potentially be used in implementation. Adaptive management allows for improved resource management by learning from management outcomes. This diagram right here shows you the adaptive management cycle and gives you a high level overview of adaptive management. So for example, I know I've used the example of vegetation treatments a lot during this presentation, but I'm gonna use it again. So for example, we might have a vegetation treatment that we plan for, and then we would do NEPA on that vegetation treatment. And you can see right here, this is where NEPA occurs in the adaptive management process, where the NEPA disclosure occurs. We would implement that vegetation treatment. We would monitor that vegetation treatment project, evaluate the monitoring results, and then determine whether or not the vegetation treatment is helping us meet our goals and objectives that are described in the resource management plan. And if they're, if if the vegetation treatment isn't quite help, isn't quite meeting our goals and objectives, we would adjust based on what we learned from doing that first vegetation treatment plan. Now I'm just gonna walk through what an adaptive management example might look like in practice, in real life. And this is complete, this is not a real example. This is actually an example I made up, but this just illustrates the concepts. So for example, you could have a resource objective that says that we're managing a recreation area for 
less than or equal than 5% bare ground. And this area would be established geo geographically so you would know what the extent of the area is. Then you would have an indicator that you would monitor to determine whether or not you were meeting, whether or not you were meeting that objective and if you were where, where you were in relationship to that objective. So your indicator in this scenario would be bare ground and that's what you would monitor. You might have a soft threshold and the concept of a soft threshold is if you hit this certain threshold such as 7% bare ground, then it might trip a soft trigger, which might be something like holding a conversation with your group to determine what kinds of actions you could take to try and decrease that bare ground. These might be actions like putting signs up to tell people to stay on the trail so we reduce the bare ground. Then you might have a hard threshold at say 10% bare ground, and that might trip a hard trigger of actually implementing a recreation permit system. So this is a very basic example, but this illustrates the concepts of how adaptive management can work in practice. BLM and its stakeholders have a history of successfully implementing adaptive management on Los Cienegas for the past 20 years. And this has been a very successful process on Los Cienegas, and we've had quite a lot of success with our resource management using adaptive management. And just before I end my presentation, I just wanna remind everyone that we have all of the information that we generated and created during the Sprinka RMP process available on our e-planning website. So for those of you that are looking for the record of decision and approved resource management plan, it's available on this website along with the proposed resource management plan and the draft resource management plan and lots of other resources. And that is all I have. So questions? Okay, so how we're doing the questions is that she will, re Amy will respond to questions in chat, not you know, um, so if you could send any questions that you have in chat, it looks like there was one, would an integrated vegetation management plan require an environmental assessment? And it was already answered as yes. So if you have other questions for Amy, if you can chat them now, I'll read them out and Amy will respond. We'll take as many as we can in order. Uh, so removal of trespassing cattle in the Sprinka has not been a BLM priority. Cattle have been seen trespassing for years at several riparian locations in the Sprinka, including the extra sensitive St. David's Yanaga. How will the BLM ensure that these cattle trespassing issues will get better rather than worse with this new increase, increased grazing? So I want to clarify, um, first before I answer this question, I want to clarify something really quickly that is in this question is that there is no increased grazing in the Sprinka. The, the decision for livestock grazing that's in the approved resource management plan and record of decision is the exact same grazing, the same exact same four allotments that the BLM has had on the Sprinka since BLM acquired the property, the, the Sprinka in 1989. That grazing has continued. And that was the decision in the approved resource management plan. So it's this exact same existing grazing. So there is no increase in grazing. Um, in, with, the, with respect to the trespass livestock grazing, BLM has grazing regulations that we need to follow to address trespass livestock grazing, and we will continue to follow those regulations. Jamie, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Um, yeah, just a little bit. And it's just a reminder that trespass grazing is by nature unpermitted. And it's something that I think every landowner will have um, on their lands on occasion. We are working towards managing that. And I think during Eric's presentation, he'll talk about that a little bit more as far as some things that we've been doing over time. Unless, Eric, you wanted to talk about some of the work we've been doing recently here. Uh, yeah, I can touch on it here. Um, it's an extremely difficult area to manage, first and foremost. We're at the bottom of a watershed. 
um, but that's really no excuse. Um, what we've been trying to do the last eight or 10 years is heavily focus on being a good neighbor. Um, so what we've been doing is trying to identify livestock, working with that livestock owner, um, identifying problem areas and boundary fences. Um, we have well over 200 water gaps that need constant maintenance. Um, but we, what we've been doing is as well as uh, hiring crews and having youth crews uh, build fence for us. We've been um, working with landowners to issue them out fencing materials um, to hopefully help out with some of that labor. Um, that's been a lot of informal stuff. We're really just trying to keep uh, good neighbors, uh, positive relationships. And um, yeah, we're really working towards that. Uh, there are still the heavy handed regulations we can enforce, um, but that would be um, repeat, trespass. Um, uh, there's another term for it, I forget offhand, but if it's uh, willful, um, we can definitely pursue those options. Okay, thanks. Let's continue. The grazing is the next topic um, of presentations, but let's continue with these. Um, we have about eight minutes for questions. So continuing on with this, in the example given of less than or equal to 5% brown bare ground, the example of a hard trigger at 10% would be actionable. Why allow so much potentially irreversible or at least very long-term damage to occur before taking action? So great question, and I appreciate this asking this question. Um, my example is purely an example. Um, so it's just trying to illustrate the concepts of soft and hard thresholds and triggers. That's where we would really want to develop, we would really want to develop hard actionable triggers before we're going to have irreversible damage. So we would really want to make those triggers based on the resource and try and prevent that irreversible damage. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is that with adaptive management, you're having that constant feedback loop. You're, you're monitoring your resource and you're looking at your data very often and consistently and you're making little adjustments. So you're really trying to make sure you don't get to that hard threshold and having to pull that hard trigger by looking at the data and trying to improve things before you ever get to that point. So BLM really wants to try and prevent us from getting to that point. And like I said, that was, that was an example, but in practice, you might, you, your hard actionable trigger might be not at 10% bare ground, for example, it might be at a lower percentage. Okay, thanks. So next there's a comment. It has been approximately a year since the record of decision was signed. And there's another comment, but you haven't apparently implemented any successful dealing with trespass cattle. It's become horrible. Um, if, if any BLM, if you want to chime in on a comment, then stop so me. I think, I think that we, we already addressed the trespass cattle issue verbally, and we can follow up further in responses to questions on that. Sounds good. Okay, but BLM plans on putting cows on Sprinka as part of the vegetation management plan. That, to me, is an increase in grazing pressure. Okay, so I'd like to address that question. Um, so I, I think you're referring to the targeted livestock grazing that was one of the methods that BLM could use in vegetation management in the, in the approved resource management plan. So I'd like to clarify that that was a method that could be used in implementation. Before that method is used, BLM will have to go through the NEPA process, which involves public involvement. So again, the resource management plan does not allow for those site-specific on-the-ground actions like I described in my presentation. And that targeted livestock grazing is very different from the permitted livestock grazing that's on the four allotments. It's a, the targeted livestock grazing is a vegetation management tool that could be used. Right now, um, right now BLM has not implemented that. And um, that would, in, if that were to be used, it would be a very controlled 
very site specific, limited in time and duration use. For example, it might be used to create a fuel break or something of that nature. So it, it, is, it is not an increase in grazing of permitted livestock grazing. Um, it's been a year since the rod was signed. What actions have been undertaken? Great question. We're going to address that in a presentation a little bit further in the meeting. The BLM's job is to protect the Sprinka and its resources, not be a good neighbor. Um, BLM received reports of cattle trespassing on the Sprinka at Fairbank on May 8, 10, 23 with photos and the potential danger to an active public site. No action or reply to numerous complaints received by it emails. Uh, I don't know if this is the time or place, but <clears throat> uh, there was some actions associated with the livestock holder um, and maybe there just wasn't a follow-up to you specifically, Chrissy Brown, um, but there have been actions. Um, it's just extremely difficult to gather. Um, maybe that was part uh, my fault for not following up uh, with that specifically. Okay, um, Western Watershed Project second, Trisha Gerardet's statement. Oh, se second those statements, yeah. Um, yes to Trisha's statement. Okay, grazing in Sprinka is theft of government property. Have you tried this approach rather than focusing so intensively on quote, being a good neighbor? Trespassing cattle mean that ranchers are not being good neighbors. They are seriously and negatively impacting cultural resources as well as other resources. My understanding is that BLM proceeded with RMP completion without the benefit of substantive consultation with interested and affected tribes. What is the status and plan for tribal cons consultations and for integrating tribal values, interests, and preferences into RMP implementation? Do you want, Jamie, do you want to answer this one now or table that um, one? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer it briefly now and we can touch on it a little bit more later on. Um, but BLM uh, hasn't come up with a broad uh, programmatic consultation for the Sprinka specifically. For any action that we do out there under Section 106, we do initiate consultation for that project specific action that we're taking. We're going to give an example of one that we've taken successfully over this last year since the RMP was signed. Um, but it, there, there are consultations. We're not avoiding or skipping that. It's just on a project by project at process at this time. Okay, and then lastly, Amy, did you want to say something? Okay, uh, protecting the Sprinka is being a good neighbor to all of us. And actually, I'll pause here for a second, and I'll say um, maybe this will be the field manager's momentary soapbox. So please, everybody, um, give me just one moment here. But I, I think as being uh, a land manager and being a neighbor to so many different people, I think it is a good thing to be a good neighbor. And when I say that, I mean this in the sense of no surprises. This meeting is really important. It's a way for us to be able to share what's going on, the information that we do have, and also get that feedback from you. It may be some opinions that we see here in the chat box. It may be some good uh, feedback as far as um, technical expertise, and so on. Um, but the key thing here is uh, with being a good neighbor is really comes down to no surprises. I, I know I don't appreciate a, a surprise if it comes up. And this meeting is one way that BLM works towards making sure that at least you're informed, that you don't get those surprises, and that we can work towards um, some, some unified management and clear objectives and intent for how we will manage this very special area. So um, when we do say um, to being a good neighbor, it is a very inclusive, broad comment. It is a very inclusive statement as far as how BLM intends on managing these lands. Okay, thank you, Jamie. And on that note, we're gonna move to, we're right at time to move to the next topic, which is livestock grazing and vegetation management. Margie Guzman will introduce the topic. And then we have two speakers on the assessment inventory and monitoring strategy and land health evaluations. And for those of you who've submitted comments that we didn't get to, 
a reminder that we, BLM, will respond to those in writing. All of the responses will be in the notes. And if any of these you can integrate into your upcoming presentations, um, then you can answer them that way as well. Okay, Margie. Hello again. Um, today, I've got several staff members that will be doing presentations on AIM and the land health evaluation processes and how we are going to be using the data to help us make decisions going forward. Um, Teresa will start, start us off with the AIM presentation and then Eric will follow up with the land health evaluation process. Go ahead, Teresa. Alrighty, let me share my screen. Oh, can you stop sharing? I think Tommy maybe or Amy? No, it looks like actually one of the participants is sharing her screen. Um, Joanne Gasper, are you able to stop sharing your screen? Actually, Teresa, try sharing it now. Okay, it seems to be working. Okay. Um, it, I Yeah, okay. Says we're still seeing. Okay. Never mind. Is it working now? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Is it in? Can you see the right thing? Yes. Okay. Awesome. All righty. Hi, everyone. My name is Teresa Kondo. I'm a biological science technician for the BLM in Tucson. Uh, my main job responsibilities are vegetation monitoring, and I'm also involved with um, invasive species control. And I'm going to be talking about the BLM's assessment, inventory, and monitoring strategy, otherwise known as AIM. AIM is a vegetation, soil, and water, resourcing, re water resource monitoring protocol that has been used by uh, other BLM offices for a little while, um, but has only been recently implemented in the Tucson field office with our first AIM data collected last year in 2019. So in this presentation, I'll give a brief explanation on why AIM was developed, the key elements of AIM, the AIM implementation process, and the methods and indicators. One of the BLM's guiding laws is the Federal Land Policy Management Act of 1976, which states that the BLM needs to maintain an inventory of land and resources that should be kept current as to reflect changes in conditions. Um, so before AIM, BLM field offices were collecting data at the local and project level, but there needed to be a standardized protocol that could be used to look at condition and trend across larger spatial scales, uh, and a system to store and manage the data um, so it can be kept for years to come. Thus, AIM was developed to be a standard approach for measuring nat natural resource condition and trend on public land. AIM can provide information on land health, wildlife habitat condition, special status sensitive species, and invasive species infestations. Um, it can also be used to inform us on any potential impacts to resources from these various uses, such as livestock grazing and recreation. There's five key elements to AIM. One is a structured implementation process to make sure that the monitoring data helps answer management questions and helps us understand ecosystems in a meaningful way. Two is standardized set of core qualitative methods and indicators to allow data comparisons throughout BLM and in collaboration with BLM partners. Three is statistically valid sample designs where it's applicable to minimize bias and maximize what can be learned from the collected data. Four is electronic data capture and management to improve data quality, use, accessibility, or and accessibility with um, the Open Access National AIM database. Five is to integrate the data with remote sensing. For example, using AIM data in conjunction with remote sensing imagery to generate continuous maps of natural resource condition and trend across the landscape. 
Structured implementation means that monitoring plans are designed to help answer appropriate management questions, such as, is an allotment meeting land health standards? Where are invasive species located and where are priority treatment areas? Are restoration treatments effective? And what are the concurrent conditions and trend of resources on the landscape that may be affected by a proposed action? So Eric will go into more detail on the process of using AIM data to help answer the first question, but I really wanna drive home that AIM is meant to be a multi-resource monitoring protocol um, used for many things like integrative vegetation management, wildlife habitat, and more. So here's that adaptive management diagram that Amy had in her presentation. And I brought it back just to show how AIM fits into the monitoring stage of adaptive management. There are three different AIM protocols, terrestrial for the uplands, lodic for streams and rivers, and lentic for wetlands and floodplains. In order to ensure the highest level of standardization and data quality, AIM has, all three of these protocols have very specific quality assurance and quality control protocols that must be followed for the data to be ingested into the National AIM database. One of these requirements is that anyone who collects AIM data must attend an official AIM training and be calibrated with others that they are collecting the data with. And all of these strict requirements are just to ensure the most unbiased and quality data possible. So far, the Tucson Field Office has only collected terrestrial AIM data on the Sprinca. Um, this is partially due to funding and partially because the LODIC protocol for streams and rivers is much newer than terrestrial. However, we are close to starting um, to monitor using LODIC AIM on the San Pedro River. So later in the presentation, I'll brief it, briefly explain um, what the LODIC indicators are and what we have planned. And finally, the National Operations Center has just recently finalized the LENTIC AIM protocol. So we're excited to implement that protocol in the future as well. All terrestrial AIM indicators are meant to provide information on the soil stability, hydrologic function, and biotic integrity of an ecosystem. And since ecosystem processes are often interconnected, usually one indicator can speak to more than one ecosystem attribute. All measurements are collected at individual plots. The standard AIM plot consists of three 25 meter transects laid out at zero, 120, and 240 degrees from plot center. Various measurements are collected along each of the transects a species inventory is collected throughout the entire plot, photos are taken at each transect, and a 70 centimeter deep soil pit is dug near plot center. There are other allowable plot layouts, such as a more linear layout um, for, that may be more appropriate for monitoring along trails and roads. In 2019, we collected AIM data at over 75 plots throughout the entire field office with 23 plots um, on the San Pedro NCA, and at least five more plots are being planned for this fall on the Sprinca. Now I'll delve into what these indicators are and the methods used to measure them. So as I said, um, measurements are taken along each of the transects. Line point intercept is collected and that gives us an estimate an estimate of vegetation cover, composition, and height, um, as well as bare ground and rock cover. Canopy cap intercept gives us an estimate of the proportion of the landscape where soil surface is in a large inner canopy gap. The species inventory throughout the plot um, lets us know, gives us an idea of plant diversity, as well as presence and absence of species of management concern, uh, such as special status species or invasive plants. Soil stability provides um, an estimate of resistance to erosion at the soil surface. 
And finally, we, met, we uh, measure plot characterization, which includes the 70 centimeter deep soil pit and collects information on soil type, landscape position, and ecological site. And this is crucial to AIM because knowing the ecological site provides context when we're analyzing the data. So we have an idea of what to expect for certain indicators like bare ground or perennial grass cover, or shrub cover, or rock cover. All right, so I mentioned earlier that we have not collected any Lodic AIM on the San Pedro River yet, um, but I wanted to go over what the main indicators are for each component of um, river health. So for water quality, we measure pH, specific conductance, temperature, turbidity, and dissolved oxygen. Uh, for watershed function and habitat quality, we measure pool depth, frequency, stream bed particle size, bank stability and cover, and large, large woody deb debris and floodplain connectivity. Um, riparian habitat quality, we measure macroinvertebrates, vegetation cover and structure and canopy cover. So right now, the plan for Lodic AIM is not set in stone, um, but we're looking at collecting data at about 11 sample reaches along the San Pedro River and two sample reaches on the Baba Kamari tributary next spring, depending upon funding. I have up on this slide a little diagram of what a sample reach look like, looks like. So you have your reach and then there's um, transects that cut across the river where you're measuring um, these different indicators. All right, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, I have on this slide an email where you can um, submit more in-depth questions to about AIM and they'll be passed on to me um, as well as the AIM website where you can find a lot more information on AIM. But uh, for now, are there any questions about this? Okay, so we only have a few minutes for questions. Um, okay. And then we'll, we'll see how, many more, how much more time we have after Eric as well. So the questions, there's plenty of things coming in. Um, are interested parties, uh, let's see. Yeah, are interested parties, interested persons going to be invited on future livestock related field trips? We'd like to be invited to, this is uh, Cindy Tool, to uh, land health evaluation and monitoring field trips. I'll take that one. So um, Cindy, thank you for your suggestions and we'll definitely take that into consideration. But I think at this time we're not ready to make a decision about that. But thank you for that input. Jamie, were you about to say something? I was going to say for, since we just did the AIM presentation, let's focus on those comments first and then we can save the grazing related ones to after Eric. Yeah, good. So the next AIM related is, does AIM allow, training allow for citizen science involvement? Um, I believe so. Yeah, the I'm, AIM is, you know, recently new or it's pretty new. Um, right now, um, most of it is done through contractors. So our, we have a contract right now through American Conservation Experience and they send their crews to that training and go out. But um, we also do some AIM in-house as well. Um, but I believe anyone can sign up for the training. And then also as far as data collection goes, um, you just need to have the training to collect the actual data. Um, you know, you can act as a data recorder um, but yeah, I'd love to figure out more about, yeah, incorporating citizen science in with AIM. The National Dame, AIM database is open to all, so it can be accessed um, as soon as all the data gets QA, QC'd, and ingested into the database, um, which actually happened just a few days ago for the Tucson field office data from last year. Um, so, so you'll be able to look at it and look at our percentage of bare ground and everything. Okay, we're going to do one more AIM question, then we'll okay. turn over to Eric. So are the AIM data going to be comparable to data collection methods from the past? Yeah, so I think that is a, one of the struggles of AIM is, you know, you have 
some data but collected in a different way and I don't think that that data just goes away, right? You can still look at, there's some comparable attributes such as perennial grass cover, shrub cover, um, and you can kind of compare those percentages and look at what you get from AIM. So it's not the exact same protocol as what's been done in the past, but it's arguably a lot more consistent, a lot less bias, and a lot higher quality data. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. Okay, thanks, Teresa. Yeah, again, questions that aren't answered will be answered in writing, um, provided at the end. Um, so next up, we have Eric Baker, uh, land health evaluations and Sprinka allotment lease renewal process overview. So Eric is going to share his screen. Oh. Yeah, do we all wish we were there? <laughs> yeah, so thanks everyone for showing up today and uh, showing an interest in these topics and just being there with us to help improve anything that we can. Um, I think it's great that we talked and had Teresa do her presentation first because it really... <clears throat> It, it's really the first thing we need to do and where we're starting with the uh, implementation process. So we're gonna cover a couple things, land health evaluations and the grazing lease renewals specific to the four Sprinka grazing allotments. So what was covered in the Sprinka RMP and its decisions? Well, the four existing grazing allotments um, were continued to exist. The acreage is about 7,000 acres of them combined, and it's just under 600 AUMs. Um, another thing was that land not available for livestock would uh, remain unallocated. So here we are in the implementation phase of the RMP um, and specific to livestock grazing decisions. Um, as Teresa said, in fall of 2019, we had uh, our AIM data collected. Uh, specifically within the allotments, we had 18 sites uh, where AIM data was collected. And then um, right in the first of the year, in January and February, uh, we collected our interpreting indicators of range on health, our 17 indicators at each of those sites. Um, good and bad, right in January, February, uh, did a ton of field work and we got shut down the very next month. So um, thankfully it's kept me busy to analyze and get all that together um, during this time of telework, but uh, here we are. Uh, so with those two things, <clears throat> it leads us to where we are right now, and that's drafting up our land health evaluations for each of these four allotments. Um, and that's kind of the first step in the total lease renewal process. Um, our next step will be NEPA compliance with an EA, and then finally to our uh, lease issuance with a final decision. So what is a land health evaluation? Um, it's a report that determines if Arizona standards for rangeland health are being achieved on an allotment. Uh, two objectives. Um, are standards being achieved? And the other, if uh, it's determined that standards are not being achieved, is livestock grazing a significant factor? Um, a quick example of something that wouldn't be a livestock factor, um, let's say you went out and did uh, 17 indicators on an area um, that had a recent fire through it, and there was uh, more bare ground than expected. It was a temporary thing, but at that time, it may not have met certain standards. Um, and the biggest thing is an LAG is not a decision document. It's a summary of analysis and interpretation of monitoring data. Five steps go along with the LAG process. The first is uh, identifying the key area, um, determine the soil and ecological site. So, Every one of those aim points, um, they're out there digging a hole in a soil pit. 
and verifying certain characteristics to make sure uh, we have the right ecological sites. Um, that's extremely important because in next uh, step two, we're getting the reference sheet from that ecological site um, to be able to reference conditions to. Step three is collecting supplementary information. Step four, rating the 17 indicators. And step five is uh, determine the functional status of the three uh, rangeland health attributes. Um, soil and site stability, hydrologic function, and biotic integrity. <clears throat> this is a map of the Babacomri allotment. Um, you can see the blue NCA line boundary um, and the four key areas. Uh, just a quick thing, uh, Babo 3 is an existing key area we had that's been read um, probably the last 12, 13 years. And um, the other three to the east were random aim points um, created last year. So all four of these points had aim data collected and uh, the 17 indicators completed on them. Uh, so the interpreting indicators of range on health. Uh, it's a qualitative assessment that determines the condition of rangeland ecosystems compared to a reference condition uh, that's determined ahead of time for each ecological site. Uh, not a single rating of rangeland health, rather a qualitative assessment of the three components, which are referred to as attributes, the soil, uh, hydrologic, and biotic. <clears throat> so each of those 17 indicators, it's uh, is based on a sliding scale of five categories based on the evaluation of the field condition against the site's reference sheet key and use the following categories. Uh, for example, a none to slight uh, departure would be at a reference condition. Uh, for example, a bare ground possibly. If a site expects 10 to 20 percent and you record 15, you would be within that reference condition state and uh, none to slight departure. And <clears throat> uh, the further you are from that departure, the more down the line you get all the way to extreme to total. Uh, so you do that for each of the three attributes, um, soil, uh, hydrologic, and biotic. And there's three overall ratings for a single site. The indicators of range on health summary. Uh, this is specific to the Baba Comri allotment, and the quantitative data from AIM was used to support these determinations. Uh, I'd like to just point out the uh, Babo 3 was within a shallow upland ecological site, and uh, every attribute was ranked none to slight. There was no departure from what was expected. Uh, moving down to the bottom, Babo 5 was in a different ecological site in Limey Upland, uh, and it had, a biggest, it had the biggest departure in its biotic integrity of moderates, and that was largely due to more creosote than what was expected for the site. Uh, to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about the Arizona standards for rangeland health and guidelines for grazing administration. Uh, standards are goals for the desired condition of the biological and physical components and characteristics of rangelands. Guidelines are management approaches, methods, and practices that are intended to achieve a standard. Some of the key things would be watershed health, the ecological processes, water quality, and habitats. So <clears throat> Arizona specifically has three standards. Uh, the first standard is upland sites. And uh, with that, uh, upland soils need to exhibit infiltration, permeability, and erosion rates that are appropriate to the soil type, climate, and landform. 
they're appropriate for the ecological site that you should be in within your key area. Uh, soil conditions support proper functioning of hydrologic energy and nutrient cycles. Uh, and we can get that from our AIM data on ground covers, uh, litter, live veg, um, a mountain types, and rock cover. And then our 17 indicators of range on health uh, help us identify signs of erosion. So the interdisciplinary team would be able to identify um, water flow patterns, gullies, reels, and plant pedestling. Um, that's a departure of what would be expected for the site you're on. Standard two is riparian wetland sites. Um, the objective is uh, to have the riparian wetland objectives in a proper function condition, as indicated by such factors as the gradient width depth ratio, channel roughness and sinuosity of the stream channel, uh, bank stabilization, reduced erosion, captured sediment, groundwater recharge, and dissipation of energy by vegetation. Uh, so PFC is a entirely separate uh, qualitative assessment, uh, but for the function uh, within our standards, we need to make sure that we are in that proper functioning condition. And finally, standard three is our desired resource condition. And uh, <clears throat> that's to have a productive and diverse upland and riparian wetland plant community of native species that exist and are maintained uh, as indicated by such factors as composition, structure, and distribution. And the biggest thing is uh, for us to develop quantitative allotment specific objectives that tier from the resource management plan. So this is a state and transition model from a limey upland uh, ecological site. Um, and I bring this up just to point out that our goal for a certain site could be different based on what site it's at and uh, what state it's in. So on the top left, the HCPC is the historic climax, uh, climax plant community state. Um, and that would be the natural variability uh, between those two drought and El Nino years and a post-fire condition. Uh, so for example, uh, ladder and echo, that'd be our white thorn and creosote canopy covers. You could expect to have 20 to 40% canopy covers. And similar to uh, Muhlenbergia and Aristida, 5 to 10%. So that feeds perfectly into uh, GRZ02. Uh, this key area will have the allotment specific objective uh, with those uh, from the Limey Upland site. Uh, maintain the perennial grass canopies of greater than equal to 5%, and to keep those creosote and white thorn shrub canopies uh, between 20 and 45. So kind of back to where we are right now, <clears throat> uh, drafting these land health evaluation reports. Uh, the first three sections, um, if you're interested in reviewing these, this is an overview of what you'll see. Uh, the first three sections are site-specific stuff about the allotment and its grazing management. Um, the section five would be its objectives, kind of what we just talked about. Um, but relating from, from an ecological site down to the key areas for each allotment. Uh, methods, kind of what we did and why, and referencing uh, technical references. Uh, the evaluation and summary, that would be uh, our 17 indicators and a write-up of that. And the determination of land health standards, that would go through each of our three standards and acknowledging whether or not it met that standard. And finally, the uh, 
recommended management actions. So this can be a spot in the evaluation that could possibly feed into the NEPA document, um, but these are just recommendations at this time. Uh, they can include um, installing new range improvements like fencing or water for better distribution. Uh, if erosion concerns were found, uh, possibly installing some of those rock dam structures like the uh, Z-Dyke structure shown, uh, even vegetative cover through uh, treatments, possibly increasing certain covers. Um, and then uh, ultimately, uh, changes to the grazing lease terms and condition can be a recommendation, such as uh, season of use. But um, once again, these are all recommendations that could be addressed in the NEPA document, um, and that would ultimately uh, say yes or no to those projects or uh, changes. Um, to step back again, we're just starting off on this process. Um, a lot has been fed into the evaluation stage, but we'll have some public review times. Um, and hopefully this time next year, we'll have uh, an EA completed and uh, that'll start a public comment process for that which ultimately is needed for the lease to be renewed with a final decision. Um, kind of before I close out, um, take note of the email address in the bottom. If we don't get to your question, uh, shoot us an email and we'll try to get you an answer. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for your time and uh, we'll open up to some questions. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, and if you think of questions, if you have questions now, obviously put them in chat. You don't need to send it to that email. That, that would be for later, after the Zoom call is finished. Um, so there are many, many chats going on. Um, there's no way we're going to get through all of this in the seven minutes that we have. So um, it seemed like um, I, what I can do is I'm going to just read the comments and questions, but and we're going to only have responses when we get to questions related to the land health evaluation and the, the topics that Eric just covered in the interest of not using up all the time on the other questions. Um, so there was, uh, and I'm going to kind of read through it really quickly. Um, protecting the spring, oh, I said that. So would any of the management actions need a NEPA? Um, visitors to the Sprinkle would probably appreciate not being surprised by encountering cows. Um, the bovophobia is interesting. Too bad the fear and prejudice is so strong with participants since domestic livestock are probably best tool to manage large landscapes. Um, we asked about AIM already. Um, let's see. So um, we asked, uh, let's see, Kim, uh, sorry, there's some questions that have been answered. Zoom, going through these rather quickly till we get to another substantive one. So few of the thousands of cultural resource sites along the river have been plotted and recorded. How is this dealt with when digging holes and carrying out other AIM tasks? So that can be answered separately because that's AIM. Will AIM also be looking at the Cienegas? How will load example sites factor in dry reaches? And if you all in BLM feel like typing in answers to any of these right now, um, type in what, what you're answering so it's not kind of in a vacuum and nobody knows what it's actually in reference to. Um, what criteria will the BLM use to identify priority treatment areas for invasive or non-native species? Will wet dry mapping be included in the monitoring? Where on the Baba Kamari River will those two sample sites be located? I'm assuming we're talking about AIM in this. Um, are you coordinating with ADEQ and non and NGOs on LODIC AIM? A lot of this has been gathered for years. Can we be invited to AIM data collection trips? Is the public excluded? AIM is still very developmental for riparian. Encouraging using methodologies for LODIC that have been used for a long time on Sprinka, use citizen science where possible. Uh, Bovifophobia, question mark, 
People told me they were afraid of the bulls because so many cattle were present with the young ones. They can be inhibiting. The water was dirty and full of cow poop, so I suggested that the adults wash their kids good when they got home after waiting and swimming in the cattle murky waters. This is a public area, not in the grazing allotment. Yes, I think when the Mormon battalion came through, there were some problems with wild bulls. Uh, anything actually happen more recently? Uh, Kay Kaylee or Kelly, I'm not actually sure. Comments are pretty off topic. Okay, one comment here, ground rules. Can you please not like call out each other? Make your own comments, but don't dispute each other's right, right in this. Uh, would it be possible for BLM? Oh, we already answered that. Will the grazing allotment EAs, environmental assessments, include alternatives besides the existing situation? Eric. Or actually, I already answered that one in the chat. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> Yes. And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Okay. Are there not federal standards for rangeland health? You identify using Arizona standards. Eric, do you want to take that one? Um, yes. Uh, I don't know. I guess I'm kind of uh, at a loss for words. <laughs> do you have something to add, Amy? Is it just referencing yes, your no, I do. laws I, yeah, and regulations? I have a, no, I have an answer to this one. Um, okay. So to answer this question, the, the standards for rangeland health are developed on a state-by-state -state basis. There, is, there isn't actually a federal standard for rangeland health that the BLM uses. They're developed on a state-by-state -state basis with, the, with input from the resource advisory committees. So... Um, Arizona's standards for rangeland health were developed in 1997 with input from the, it's the resource advisory committee, the RAC. Um, and each, so each state for BLM has different standards for rangeland health that they manage for. Yeah. Okay, so then a follow up. Weren't the Arizona standards for rangeland health with livestock grazing in mind, are they relevant for riparian management? They are relevant for riparian management in areas where we have the livestock grazing use overlapping a riparian area. Will the results? Yes. Okay, sorry. Sorry, uh, that comes into standard two. If an allotment has riparian within it, um, that would justify using standard two and rationalizing why or why it wasn't met. Okay. Will the results of the allotment environmental assessments result in BLM allotment management plans? Allotment management EMPs. Yeah, um, we've had this discussion recently. Um, AMPs are, are older plans that were meant to provide certain criteria of information. And really, um, it is a, a legal term, I understand that, but the land health evaluations are producing all of that information plus more. Um, so that, that's a really good discussion to have because um, if an AMP is needed on top of, uh, let's say we get the land health evaluation done, um, a NEPA uh, compliance EA done, an AMP is still needed, um, I think that'd be a good discussion to have kind of act the fact to see what are we going to be doing from this point on. Okay. Kim Ryan uh, responded to uh, Denny. AIM locations are subject to cultural resources review and approval to avoid cultural sites. Another comment, is LODIC AIM data incorporated into the rangeland analysis? Uh, in my opinion, after visiting the Baba Kamari River on the BLM's allotment, you need to monitor some different key reaches. Thank you, Bob Lucha, Luce, oh, sorry, for reminding me that the BLM is using, quote, rangeland indicators. Why would the Spranka be considered as rangeland? Would it be better to consider it as grassland and evaluate it from that point of view? I think that's a question. Eric, do, you want to, do you want to take that one? I want to defer to you. I feel like you can give a better overarching answer. Sorry, Tani, can you just summarize the question really quickly? Would it be better to consider 
BLM is using rank, quote, rangeland indicators. Would that, why would Sprinka be considered a rangeland versus considering as grasslands and evaluate it as a grassland instead of a rangeland? So good question. And as you remember in development of the resource management plan, we have goals and objectives in the resource management plan that we need to manage for. So the the standard, the Arizona standards for rangeland health are kind of an overarching standard that we need to meet. And then we also need to meet the goals and objectives that are in our resource management plan. So in the areas where we have livestock grazing, which are on, um, which Eric showed a map of in his presentation are on up just under those 7,000, just under 7,000 acres. We our regulations require that we look at those Arizona standards for rangeland health. But in addition to that, we also need to make sure that we're managing for the goals and objectives that we established in our resource management plan in the spring. So we're really looking at it. At, we're also looking at the area through the lens of upland and through our biotic communities that we discussed in the resource management plan. Okay, so we're at 2.20, which is the time we need to move to the next presentation. Sorry, we couldn't get through all of them. Again, a reminder that they will all get addressed. They will all be included in the notes. So our next um, topic, this is the last of the presentations, and this is um, the Sprinka Resource Management Plan Implementation, Progress and Opportunities. Amy. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I'm just going to talk really quickly about what we have implemented from the resource management plan to date and some of the things we've been working on. Like I said, I'm gonna talk about what we have implemented to date. Kim is going to talk a little bit about the Fairbank Mercantile Stabilization Project, Kim. Thanks, Amy. Um, I think most everybody here today is probably familiar with Fairbank and the buildings there, but for those who aren't, just a really a quick overview that the uh, Fairbank town site is a, a historical town site that is designated for public use and interpretive purposes on the Sprinka. And one of the remaining five buildings that exists there is the Fairbank Mercantile, also referred to as the Adobe Commercial Building. Uh, that building uh, was initially built uh, starting in 1882 and had some subsequent additions put onto it into the early 1900s. It was in operation until 1973 when the town site was abandoned. We had a very tragic collapse of a segment of wall on the eastern side of the Adobe Mercantile. And we were able to secure funds and a contract that we were able to implement starting in October of 2019 uh, with completion of work on site in April, this past April. And you can see there the above photo is the completed work and the below photos are um, the sad state of affairs that we were working to fix. Um, and the, we also had concerns about vegetation and subsidence and so there was a great deal of careful work that needed to be done to stabilize the walls and also remove the fence around uh, the building so that the public can come up to it now, which they hadn't been able to for several years, and actually uh, experience the building kind of up close and personal. Um, the importance of us doing this work is in line with our goals and objectives in the RMP because we have several um, historic properties on the Sprinka uh, that are designated for public use, and we really are interested in continuing to work with our partners on making sure that are more heavily visited sites like the town site here and the San Pedro house and also the Presidio de Santa Cruz de Terranate, that we are able to continue to do maintenance, restoration and stabilization work there. In addition to working with partners to identify what other sites um, might benefit from work in public use. Amy? Thank you, Kim. We are now going to have Francisco talk about our implementation of areas available and unavailable for hunting with firearms. Francisco. Thank you, Amy. 
Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, one of the decisions that was made in the RMP that went in effect as uh, so of the approval was the lifting of the uh, restrictions on the use of firearms for hunting uh, in the NCA. Uh, there were restrictions also on target shooting. Uh, those remain in place. Uh, this decision was made essentially to expand hunting opportunities on BLM lands in response to secretarial orders and input from the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Before the change, um, lifting the uh, firearm um, these restrictions during hunting, the NCA was open to hunting, uh, but it had restrictions in the area south of Highway 82 uh, down to uh, Hereford. Uh, making the uh, NCA essentially a archery hunting area. With a decision, approximately uh, 5,100 acres of the NCA are now open to hunting with firearms, which is essentially the entire area, with the exception of about 5,000 acres that are in areas that BLM identified as safety zones. The safety zones were identified to protect developed recreation sites where people are likely to be at all times, as well as adjacent uh, residential areas. The map that you see here shows in green the um, areas that are uh, designated as safety zones. Uh, and so to implement the uh, decision this last uh, fall and winter, uh, BLM put together some visitor information uh, aimed at the hunters and the non-hunters uh, so that uh, both were informed of the change and the possibility that hunters will be encountered uh, in the area. We put together a question and answer sheet about the change, uh, the reasons for the change and what is now allowed. Uh, we put together a set of maps that show the uh, National Conservation Area access points, the trail system, as well as the safety zones. And we installed signing uh, on the ground at the access points, uh, both uh, developed access points and others uh, that uh, hunters use to access the NCA. Uh, and we installed signs around the uh, uh, safety zone boundaries. The information was posted online. Uh, we made it available at the visitor contact stations at the BLM office in Tucson, in Hereford, uh, and with the uh, Prince of San Pedro at the uh, San Pedro House and at the Fairbank uh, Schoolhouse. We are now um, reviewing the uh, information and signing that we completed, see if we need to make any changes before this upcoming hunting season uh, next fall and next winter. And uh, in addition to implementing you know, that particular decision, we are uh, continuing to maintain the facilities, the access uh, points, parking lots, trails, um, and other facilities that we have, which is also according to plan. That's it for me. Uh, back to you, Amy. Thank you, Francisco. And then Dave Murray is going to talk a little bit about the ongoing resource monitoring that we are doing. Dave? Um, thanks, Amy. Um, we um, continued on this year with the annual wet and dry um, with our partners, and um, we look forward to engaging uh, with a larger group, hopefully in the next in the next years. Um, um, and we continued stream flow and groundwater depth monitoring. And um, as Teresa mentioned, uh, the AIM monitoring was implemented in the uplands. Uh, terrestrial, and we are looking at implementing the LODIC monitoring. Um, bird mapping survey, the MAPS bird surveying survey was done um, at the garden wash site, and um, the annual fish population survey was also completed. Thank you, Dave. So now that we've talked about some of the things we've implemented to date, we're going to talk about opportunities mo moving forward into implementation. And so the opportunities for engagement and involvement as we move forward into implementation involve engagement in the riparian issues, in the upland issues, in recreational issues, as well as cultural resource issues. And Tani, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, thanks. Can you, oh, there you go. All right, so 
um, many, some of you may be involved in the Las Cienegas um, adaptive management bioplanning process. Um, we're learning from that and adapting it to, to suit the Sprinka situation. So this is a, just a schematic, like a conceptual potential way it could work. Um, we have in the middle uh, topical working groups are basically uh, the blue circles. And those might be those four topics that Amy just mentioned. We want to hear from you. Uh, there will be a survey sent out after this meeting where you're going to be able to indicate what kind of topics uh, you are interested in. And so we would set those up based on actual interest. Um, and then one uh, stakeholder field based day, kind of like the bio planning in Los Angeles, for those of you who go to that, that would potentially be in the spring. Um, so, and then some kind of a coordination group with BLM and representatives of those topical teams, topical working groups that would try to ensure that there's some cross topic coordination that um, the coordinating team meeting say on the far left would be helping the BLM plan that annual field meeting, um, helping the BLM uh, sort through the comments and the input, um, following the meeting, um, helping um, in, you know, move those things into um, where the BLM can make decisions and kind of close that adaptive management loop. That doesn't happen just at one point necessarily. This is conceptual. Um, and the kind of accordion in and out of topical working groups working on things that are going to be relevant. For example, um, different agencies and others that have technical expertise coordinating um, and problem solving together, that kind of thing. The aim process would be happening at different points along the way and would feed in um, to the process, sharing data for discussion, field-based um, at least once a year again. So that this is just a schematic um, of how it might look. Um, and so what we're going to do next, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, thanks. So we have um, four breakout groups. You're about 12-ish people per breakout group. Um, and for those of you who have not used Zoom breakouts, I'm going to click on a link that says open all rooms and you're going to just automatically go to one of those four breakout rooms. We have Southwest Decision Resources and BLM pairs of, of people uh, in each room to facilitate and take notes. And we're, you're going to really discuss these three questions. One, what are your thoughts on the proposed adaptive management and stakeholder engagement approach for implementation of the Sprinka Resource Management Plan? Kind of like I just showed you. Uh, two, how would you like to be involved? Again, you're going to have the opportunity after as well to, with your name, indicate what, what areas you're interested in. And three, do you have any other ideas, suggestions, or questions? You're going to have um, 15 minutes, I believe, in the groups. And I'll be broadcasting a little note to indicate how much time you have remaining. When you join back up, the facilitators will give a very brief synopsis of your group. Uh, but the note takers are taking notes on everything. So all that will get integrated into the notes so that you will find out what was discussed in the other groups. Um, any questions? I, I believe we don't have time for <laughs> questions. Unless it's about this specifically, you can chat to me. Your chats in those group rooms are only in the room. So uh, the facilitator or the note taker are going to save the chat so that that gets integrated into the notes as well. And once you get into your breakout room, you can turn on your video, turn on your audio, and then participate you know, more in a real, a real personal way. So on that note, I'm going to um, open the rooms.
Those of you who haven't gone yet to your rooms, there should be a, a question and just click yes, like join breakout room. And if you're having any problems, just unmute and you can ask. <laughs> Hello, all. Hey, Tani. Hello. Nice to see your faces. Feel free to keep your videos on for this last few minutes. Okay. So um, we're going to just take a few, just a very quick report back from each room, starting with Colleen Whitaker. Okie doke. Um, so our group, um, first we kind of talked about learning from what's been happening in Las Cienegas um, and how just keeping an eye on how that process has gone because it's been going for a long time and, and building off that um, with tweaks obviously as needed. Uh, some con sh concerns shared about making sure that um, how the aim really gets included in this and the monitoring, there's still some questions around kind of how that's going to go and making sure that all the, the monitoring that's happened up to now and the citizen science, particularly around riparian on the San Pedro, really gets included properly. So it seems like there may be some good opportunities there to really think that through up front before, you know, as we're setting up this process. Um, and, and really those were the main points actually, just thinking really clearly about how we effectively integrate the science and monitoring into this implementation process with the stakeholders. Okay, great. Thanks. Next up, uh, Amy Marks, or not Amy Markstein, sorry. For, formerly Markstein. <laughs> okay. It's okay, I still respond to Markstein. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, so our group also mentioned, mentioned Las Cienegas and looking at some of the the things that are a little bit different about the Sprinca and taking those into consideration as we move forward into implementing adaptive management in the Sprinca. And our group, uh, our group actually was one word that was used was cautiously optimistic about the process moving forward and was happy about the opportunity to have dialogue and to come together to discuss some of these topics in a bit more detail. And one suggestion that was made, especially when while we're in this virtual environment, is to try and be creative and think about some alternative ways to have some additional interaction as we move forward into implementation. Great. June. Yes, um, our group was, you know, generally supportive of the adaptive management process. They liked that. Um, they did have some input on, you know, when we do decide to start getting information that we would gather that before we come out with a plan, of course, or a proposed plan. Um, they wanted us to be very thoughtful in the way that we design the public participation process you know, noting that it's kind of separate from those NEPA processes and just be mindful of people's time um, when we design those and also come up with very specific asks for what we need from them so that they're able to come back with good information. And there was a suggestion that maybe we could look at things such as invasive grass removal. Great, thank you. And we know these are just synopses. There's more that was discussed, of course. Uh, lastly is Colleen Bergmanis. Yes, actually uh, kind of similar and relevant to all the other breakout sessions. Um, also uh, trying to understand the relationship between the adaptive, ma ma adaptive management process that we are already undertaking at Los Angeles 
and how that relates to the Sprinka. Um, basically depends different, different locations. So um, uh, different actions will be taken, but the process is pretty much the same. Uh, we did have some concerns about the adaptive management process in general, however, um, suggesting that uh, looking at how bad something is getting um, might not be the right approach um, and would like to possibly look at maybe, yeah, being a part of that conversation perhaps a little bit more closely. Um, we did also have uh, someone who asked that our, uh, our sovereign nations be more looped in. Um, they, uh, yeah, just make sure that they're more part of the process um, and more informed um, that our indigenous communities are, are part, more part of the process than they have been in the past. Um, yeah, very similar to other, other conversations. Great. Okay, thanks so much. So um, in conclusion for the meeting, a quick synopsis of the next steps. Again, I've said it a few times, we'll be sending out a summary, the notes from the meeting, which includes all the chat, the responses to questions, whether they were answered in the meeting or not, all the answers will be there. Um, the recording of the meeting will be provided for anybody who wasn't able to attend. Uh, we'll send a follow-up survey to get a sense for who is, which of you are interested in which kinds of topics, so we can set up working groups based on where, where there is actual interest in energy. Um, and after we've had a chance with the BLM, follow-up to this, we'll be back in touch about what the next steps would be. Um, Jamie, would you like to make some final comments? Sure, I, thank you very much. And, Honestly, thank you for everybody for joining in and just looking again through all the participants and um, truly there's a great wealth of knowledge, experience, and expertise and history here with this group. Um, and we really do value that and we look forward to being able to work with you in the, the weeks, the months and years that come. Um, and hopefully one of these days, it won't be over Zoom. We'll actually be able to go and back out there on the ground and actually get our feet a little dirty and, and everything. But um, I look forward to continuing to work with each one of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. And thanks for sticking with us for two hours. Um, uh, we'll, we'll leave the, the room open for, the Zoom open for a few minutes um, as you wanna leave. But if you have any final chats you wanted to type in or anything, feel free to. Um, and I think um, that's the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Katie, for that, that suggestion. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Joy and Kaylee.
Hope you both have a good week. We'll be in touch.